the term cognitive bias or cognitive illusion is also a term that gets used a lot was initially uh, proposed as a way of thinking about how our judgments went went awry or our decisions went awry um, and therefore to give us a, a kind of insight into how we actually make decisions so that so the analogy with visual illusions is, is quite a useful one so often when we look at uh, visual illusions they tell us something about how the visual system works so famous illusions like there's one called the Muller liar illusion it's one where you have two lines and there's arrows that point inwards on one line and point outwards on another line and the direction that the arrowheads point make it look like one line is much longer than the other but in fact they're mm. the same they're exactly the same length and the fact that we see those lines as different lengths tells us something about how the visual system works it tells us something about how how it kind of adapts but it also shows some some biases some some departures from reality if you like and, and Kahneman and Tversky in their early work kind of used this idea of analogy with visual illusions to talk about cognitive bias or cognitive illusions I'm joined today by Professor Ben Newell, Professor of Cognitive Psychology at the University of New South Wales and the Deputy Head of the School of Psychology. Uh, Ben's research focuses on the cognitive processes underlying judgment, choice and decision making and the application of this knowledge to the environmental, medical, financial and forensics contexts. He is the lead author of Straight Choices, The Psychology of Decision Making, and is on the editorial boards of the Psychonomic Bulletin and Review, Thinking and Reasoning, Decision Journal, and the Journal of Behavioral and Decision Making and Experimental Psychology. Thank you very much for joining me, Ben. It's a pleasure. Look, I think uh, to jump into it, uh, Ben, um, in terms of exploring my interests, uh, psychology, psychology, cognitive bias, um, and decision making has always been of interest to me. I think anyone that has had experiences with adult as a young person and decisions that you wouldn't really think make sense um, have led me to thinking, well, that's interesting. Why do people make those de- decisions? Um, and then insofar as, uh, uh, as uh, bigger problems like climate, I think that definitely comes to mind as well when you think there's all this evidence that's come come out from the scientific community since the 90s since the 80s really um and global action on things like climate biodiversity and even other bigger problems which i'm sure your research focuses on um it makes makes you wonder how, how can decisions be made the way that they're being made so i thought to begin with i wanted to see um if you could explain, you know, what what are cognitive biases and how do they impact our decision making? Well, uh, it's a it's a big topic. It's a huge topic. Mm. The, the notion of a cognitive bias, uh, I guess, was popularized first by the work of Daniel Kahneman and, and Amos Tversky, who many people who've got even a fleeting interest in this area will probably have heard about. And the 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 term cognitive bias or cognitive illusion is also a term that gets used a lot, was initially uh, proposed as a way of thinking about how our judgments went went awry, our decisions went awry, um, and therefore to give us a, a kind of insight into how we actually make decisions. So that so the analogy with visual illusions is, is quite a useful one. So often when we look at uh, visual illusions, they tell us something about how the visual system works. So famous illusions like there's one called the Muller liar illusion. It's a bit hard to describe on a podcast, but it's, it's one where you have two lines and there's arrows that point inwards on one line and point outwards on another line. And the direction that the arrowheads point make it look like one line is much longer than the other, but in fact, they're mm. the same. They're exactly the same length. And the fact that we see those lines as different lengths tells us something about how the visual system works. It tells us something about how how it kind of adapts, but it also shows some some biases, some some departures from reality, if you like. And and Kahneman and Tversky in their early work kind of used this idea of analogy with visual illusions to talk about cognitive bias or cognitive illusions. 
And, and the sort of classic ones are things like the availability bias, the representativeness bias, um, and, and anchoring. So to give a, a, a basic illustration of those, an availability bias is when I ask you, uh, you know, which of two events might be more likely, that, that a person is murdered or that a person commits suicide. And at the time when these, the, this work was being done, the overwhelming response that people had to that was, was murder. And the explanation for that was that reports of murders are often more uh, prominent in the media than reports of suicides. And so when you try to think about instances of murders versus suicides, more instances of murder come to mind than suicide. And so you think, oh, well, look, the answer is probably murder. And they mm -hmm. described that kind of effect as, a, as the operation of an availability heuristic or availability bias. Mm. Um, and again, the, the analogy to the illusions is that most of the time, you know, our visual system is highly adaptive and it works very well, but sometimes it leads us to see things erroneously. Availability, usually, you know, the, the ease with which I can generate an instance or think of instances, how quickly they come to mind is usually a, mm. a very good cue or heuristic for making a judgment about frequency. But on occasions, it will lead to the wrong type of decision. It will lead to this, this biased um, estimate. So that's one type of cognitive bias. Another type of cognitive bias is where you can show that people's judgments and decisions don't necessarily follow uh, rational normative expectations. So a lot of the discussion in the literature is between this sort of um, caricature homo economicus, the, you know, the individual that follows only maximizing utility and thinking about um, the, the, the money effectively, you know, the economics of the situation versus the, the homo sapiens who is um, characterized as, as someone that has more kind of cognitive limitations. They don't have unlimited resources to make these kinds of decisions. And so you can demonstrate that those kinds of things are, are operating if you give people simple choices between gambles and you can show that they're not necessarily choosing ac according to a rational expectation, or you can show that they deviate uh, from the predictions of, say, probability theory. So people will judge on the basis of similarity of instances rather than judging in terms of the, the, the rules of probability. And the classic example of that is, is known as the conjunction fallacy or the conjunction bias, um, mm. which is mm. there's a, there's a, a problem called the Linda problem, which some people may have come across. And that's also explained then in terms of this representativeness. And that's been a very powerful metaphor for thinking about this relationship between how people actually make decisions and what rational or normative prescriptions are. Um, we, hopefully we'll get into it a bit later on. I, I think mm. that there's, you know, and I'm not the only person that thinks this, but th that there's been too much emphasis then on the cognitive bias side, mm. too much emphasis pushing towards the idea that we're kind of cognitive misers. You know, we mm. avoid mental effort. Uh, we need help in making decisions all the time. And, and there's, a, there's a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy or perpetuating mm. um, metaphor there that that is that is de de disempowering and i think that that's problematic especially mm. when it comes to big issues like climate change yeah absolutely yeah and i think um i think we'll definitely get into that because uh as something which is related to maybe more social psychology is the idea of maladaptive behavior where if you're grown up in a in a certain in a certain environment you sort of grow up uh, sort of adapting as a as a as a child in response to those to those environmental factors and and such that when you grow older you're able to sort of uh, you may carry those behaviors and they become maladaptive and so it would would be more, more than happy to jump into that later and um, something I thought uh, when when I first came across cognitive dissonance or cognitive bias I was learning about it in a in a marketing class. Um, and the lecturer who was sort of explaining cognitive dissonance uh, was explaining it in a way that I didn't really think it really captured the 
relative importance of the topic or how it can impact individuals on such a wide scale. Um, and so I thought I'd tell a very quick story, which you may be familiar with, um, but there was this member in America. Uh, that, so there was a, a, a young man called Derek Black and his father was a very prominent man, member of the Ku Klux Klan. Um, and once he got to the age of university, he eventually went to university to a relatively small college. And over the over the year of his first year at university, um, he was sort of uh, people came up to find out that he was this prominent member. But he had this friend who was pretty sympathetic to his position, could understand that you know if you've grown up in a certain environment. Um, no, you're, it's not going to be any surprise that you're going to have these very strong beliefs. Um, but instead of pressing him on these beliefs, which everyone had been doing at the university once they found out, he sort of just became his friend, went out to dinner with him very often. And then eventually after gaining his trust and, you know, being close friends, uh, he started sort of challenging him on his positions. And unlike before where if someone had challenged him on his positions, um, regarding uh, sort of racial ideas, whatever whatever Ku Klux Klan members believe. Um, because he, uh, if it came from a non-friend, someone he didn't trust, they, he could just discredit what they said really. Um, whereas because it was his friend challenging him and he'd sort of trusted him and been friends with him for a, a long time, um, he sort of had to really consider what he was saying. And eventually this led to an undoing of his ideology. And now he's a, uh, a PhD student of history at, in Florida, and, and he sort of widely disavows his views, and he's sort of a prominent, uh, I guess, uh, anti-radical, uh, I guess, uh, figurehead. And so I thought this was a really, really illustrative example of the power of cognitive dissonance, of cognitive bias, and also the power of trust and sort of undoing, um, undoing things that you may not have arrived, ideas that you may not have arrived at through true rational thinking. Um, I was wondering if you had any stories or any studies or case studies about the power of, uh, of, of good or bad decision-making in sort of forming cognitive biases, cognitive dissonance and, and the like. Um, I mean, I, th I think that there's, a, there's a distinction there between it, the way that you think about cognitive bias and the way you think about cognitive um, dissonance and you know your story there seems to me to be one of a, a longer term change in your your attitude towards something or your opinion towards something and as you mm. say the idea of trust coming into it is is really really important I mean I think in general when we come to issues like the the climate or um, things where people have perhaps deeply ingrained or deep deep beliefs one way or another, it can be very difficult to change those those beliefs. And there's mm. you know, work showing that it's not necessarily so much telling people the facts and trying to mm. get them to think about the facts, but it's aligning the information with their pre-existing socio-political beliefs or their, you know, their mm. values. Um, and if we can align those kinds of things, then then rather than trying to completely flip people's attitudes around, it's more about you know going kind of going with the grain rather than going against the grain with these people. So, in terms of mm. I guess, specific stories, like, I mean there there are in in the I was I was reading something the other day written by a guy who is quite active in trying to get climate education and climate um, literacy into schools um, mm -hmm. who started his career working in the fossil fuel area and has sort mm -hmm. of, you know, come to the realisation that, okay, yes, I put a lot of my working life into that industry and that was a, a perfectly good industry to be in and to be working in. Um, and But at a certain point thought, okay, now I actually want to, to, to shift my focus and I've, I've realized that that industry is, is limited in how much longer we can really go on using those kinds of resources and so I sort of flipped over 
a bit like your example to to someone that now is focusing on on climate um, climate education in mm. schools effectively and mm. and I, I think you know whether that's exposure to rational thinking or whether it's just a gradual change in the information and the environment that you find yourself in and the access to different information that, that you have whether you trust the sources of information that that you're um, that you're reading at the, or, you're, or that you're accessing, but it's a gradual. I think it's a gradual process. It's not in all of these areas. It's, it's not going to be suddenly we describe these issues in this way, and then you know it's a magic bullet that suddenly people go, "Oh, right, I get it now." Uh, let's all do mm. things about climate change. It's 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 a very broad humans. I mean, it's, it sounds trite to say it, but we're very complex. We're driven by lots of different motivations and urges and um, cognitions and so it, it's unlikely there's going to be a kind of one-size-fits-all solution to these issues mm, mm, definitely well i think this uh, talking about complexity in humans um i think it would be a good opportunity to take up sort of the point you were making to begin with so you're making the point that we have the ability to be sort of uh, fooled by our, uh, our uh, by visual illusions. We have the ability to be fooled by, um, I guess, logical fallacies. Mm-hmm. And, and although the emphasis is on, you know, how bad we may be or how not, not perfect we may be, um, it all comes from somewhere. And yep. so, you know, these are adaptive behaviors. So how did, why, why is this a, an important factor to sort of take into consideration that it's an adaptive behavior and what else would you have to say on that front? Well, I think, you know, the, the, the major point is that if we continue to kind of emphasize this, this metaphor of, of being um, biased and kind of being buffeted around by forces that are outside of our, um, awareness. So, you know, another area of interest that I've had over the years is is looking at the influence of of information that's supposedly outside of our awareness, kind of unconscious influences on decision making. Mm-hmm. And there's a whole literature that argues that that things that that we're not aware of are, are driving our behaviour. So, you know, we're exposed to some. Mm stimulus we might not even see that stimulus or we're not aware that it's bad but but somehow it's changing our it's changing our behavior and and there's you know a lot of kind of contentious evidence out there i've actually got a a new book coming out later in the year um called open-minded searching for truth Mm. about the unconscious mind and and it it really goes through some of these uh so-called demonstrations of unconscious influences which make us look kind of irrational and and perhaps you know not not highly adapted to the to the situations that we're in mm. and shows mm. that or argues that the evidence underpinning many of those examples is not particularly strong uh, mm. and that they can be you know you might be able to illustrate these things in in experiments where there are there are demand effects where people are acting in accordance to the way they think the experimenter wants them to behave or their very fleeting, very brief influences on behavior, but how they then actually translate into what we're doing out in the world when we're making these more consequential decisions is, is far less, um, it's far less clear what the, what those kind of influences are. So if you, mm. if you combine, you know, that thinking about, okay, the, the 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 claims that are made for unconscious effects are not super strong, and this overemphasis on being cognitive misers and effort avoiders and biases sort of pro- promulgates this idea that that we need that we need help all the time that we need to be um, given you know direction in in the way that we're making our decisions and this is. You know the whole area of of nudges and and sort of behavioural mm. economics has grown up out of that original proposition from the heuristics and biases um, type type perspective. So the heuristics and biases is you know is enforcing reinforcing this idea that we need help in making our decisions, and so the nudge idea is okay. We need to design. Uh, decision environments choice architectures where we where we help people where we nudge people to make the right choice because they can't do that for themselves mm. 
And mm. that has a certain appeal to it, but it also, I think, does reinforce the sort of abdication of responsibility that I, I can't do it, so you have to change the, the you know, I, I can't help myself in taking the chocolate bar off the shelf, so you have to put the chocolate <laughs> bar in a different place in the supermarket so that I mm. don't, don't take it. And, yes, you know, there is clear... Um, there is there is a, a, a clear role for that kind of technique and those kinds of things or, or you know, I'm going to make the green energy plan your default plan so that you choose it kind of unthinkingly. But it's, but it's naive to think that you can change behaviour massively using these kinds of little techniques that play on our mm. supposed fallibilities because we are very complex. We, we do adapt to different situations we do have the ability to think okay i i understand that that you want me to to choose this option because you've put it in this prominent position um but mm. i don't want to choose that because i have different motivations i have different different mm. values so again these techniques are not going to have universal impact and universal effect and the overemphasis of the the cognitive bias cognitive miser metaphor um, I think elevates the idea that these simple techniques will change our behaviour, and, mm, and my absolutely. my perspective is more that we should we should treat people as you know people people think people can mm. work through problems they can solve very complex situations all all the time and yes there are certain mm. traits that maybe make us. Um, choose things that are easier at the time because we do want to avoid the effort but not not everything and not all the time and, and getting that balance between respecting the kind of cognitive competency that we have and uh designing choices designing policy environments really in ways that can maximize those competencies rather than assume that we're we're biased and and uh mm. hopeless is, is an important yeah. balance to strike Mm, yes, no, and I do appreciate your optimism, Ben, and uh, and uh, pers pursuit in this area because I think it's very much needed. Um, and in terms from an ecological point of view, I mean, you see it all the time where uh, ideas of sort of uh, where we sort of disempower people within movements, um, uh, not intentionally, but sort of pointing at, you know, people have things like co confirmation bias, you can't change their opinions, you know, uh, uh, climate deniers, you know, it's so hard, This it's just cognitive bias, we can't change it. And so I think the idea of, you know, sort of equipping people with the tools needed to understand that cognitive bias is a thing, but then to, like you said, empowering people by providing them with tools and ideas and uh, critical thinking to sort of overcome uh ideas that you know uh are purely deterministic you know there's nothing i can do i it is what it is if i walk past a, a flower shop i'm gonna ask a girl on a date there's nothing i can do those <laughs> sorts of things um and so i suppose this brings me to uh, the next question which i would have for you um which is you know what what can we do effectively about uh, uh cognitive biases cognitive dissonance um and how to resolve them. I think the one thing I've heard personally is being aware of it is one of the most important steps. Um, so would you say that first we need to educate the masses on what they are in terms from a general audience point of view and then step into, well, this is how you overcome it or can we skip A altogether and just go straight to B? What do you think? It's a good question. Um, and, and I think there is, you know, a fair bit of debate about whether – just being aware of the fact that you may not make the right, the, the, the normatively correct choice when you're dealing with probabilistic outcomes or when you're trying to interpret uncertainty or, you know, if, if you're aware of things like availability. So, you know, did I just come up with that answer because it was the first thing that I thought of and should I just stop and, and think about that a little bit more? Um, whether that that awareness actually improves your ability to be be resistant if you like to those those kinds of effects i mean mm. i think i think the awareness step is certainly it's a it's a useful discussion to have it's an important idea to mm -hmm. get to get out there but i think it does as i was saying before it's that risk of it leading to 
sort of a, a, a disempowering state, right? That that oh, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm hopelessly biased, and you know I can't can't think for myself, and I'm just going to be, um, as you say, buffeted around by the <laughs> walking past the fire shop. Um, mm-hmm. There's there's a huge literature on on debiasing techniques. A lot of it boils okay. down to uh, effectively increasing your your critical thinking or, or second guessing yourself in a way. Mm. One of the techniques that gets get, gets talked about is um, this simple kind of consider the opposite strategy. So if mm. you come up with a particular conclusion, you know, a particular answer to a question, then just think, well, what are some other reasons that it might be, you know, something else? So mm. it, it, even with, you know, simple uh Simple questions like, I don't know, how many, with, with anchoring biases, right? So if I give you a number mm. and then ask you a quantity, so if I say, mm. um, you know, do you think that the number of seats in the opera house is more or less than 200? What do you think? In the I'd main, say more main than theater, 200. I'd yeah, I'd say more than two hundred. Yeah. And, and now, what would you what would you come up with as your as your answer? <laughs> so, because I sort of know how anchoring biases bias works, I'm trying. I'm sort of thinking. Okay, I'm I'm thinking it's much higher than two hundred. But now I'm thinking. Okay, I don't. <laughs> I, I want to give a. I want to give a, a a true a, a true and accurate answer. I don't know. Maybe like. I don't, um, this, maybe five thousand. I don't know. Is that way too high? I don't even know now. The problem with this with this example is that I don't know the answer. One of us is going to have to Google it and find out. Okay, well, I'll, 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 I'll Google. I think five thousand is too high, but I, I yeah. think it's more like two thousand. But but you know the example. The idea is that oh, I wow. said, yeah. What it's is actually five thousand seven hundred. Wow, oh, that, was, okay. that was pretty good. Oh, okay, very good. <laughs> Better than me. Okay. But the the idea is that if I then said. Um, do you think it's more or less than 20,000? You know that 20,000 mm. is going to be too high, but your estimate that you might then give me maybe would be, yeah, would have been higher, right? In your case, yeah, yeah, you, yeah. because we're talking about it in the context of debiasing, you know, you're, mm. you're thinking through and you're, you're trying to come up with a, with a proper um, mm. Mm. answer. But it, it's illustrative for two reasons, this, this example. One is that, so one way to debias it is to say, um, okay, I came up with that estimate of, of, of 2,000 or 5,000. How did I come to that? Then maybe mm. I, I try to think again, what, what's another strategy that I might use to generate that number? Or why mm. might I have got that first estimate wrong? If I can generate another estimate and I then sort of average the two of those, I can sometimes be more more accurate I'm kind of bootstrapping mm. my initial my initial estimate the other reason yeah. why why anchoring in this context and linking back to what I was talking about before is is interesting is that in 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 standard conversations where we are there's a kind of communicative intent between two a speaker and a listener or two speakers, right? So when we're having this conversation, we're giving each other signals in our conversation that, you know, invites one particular answer or imparts some particular mm-hmm. information. And it, if you think about the case of, of anchoring, if you don't know anything about it, right, then the number that I give you in the question, you might, as a, as a listener, interpret that as having some use, right? Mm. Why, why would I... As a speaker, say two hundred. If two hundred was a completely irrelevant number, or mm. why would I say mm. two million? If two million was a completely irrelevant, and you know that as a listener, right? And so th- this is a, is a sort of another perspective on how these things work. It's a an idea called information leakage, which mm. is the idea that in the way the question is asked or the way the information is framed. There, mm. is, there is additional information that leaks from that. So the fact that mm. I've given you the 200 provides a kind of cue or a signal to you that, oh, well, maybe it's mm. around 200 because if it's not, you know, why would you, why would you tell me that? Mm. And the fact mm. that I can make you look silly or you can make me look silly by giving a number that's completely, completely wrong is perhaps not because you're being 
irrational. It's just that mm. you're taking a cue that I've used and using it in good faith, and that's leading you to a wrong answer. So as the experimenter, mm. I can then laugh at you and say, oh, you got it wrong. Or mm. in your case, you can laugh at me because I got it wrong. But um, do, do, you see, do you see the distinction I'm making? There's yeah, the, the absolutely. information in, in the way that I have chosen to, to frame that. Mm. Which yeah, questions it, the it, rationality of the judgment? It's it's super intuitive, and you can understand. I mean, perhaps this is a an ick of uh, of of uh, of people like yourself, where I sort of go back to sort of primor primordial ages. But I could see if in in that context, how way the ways things are. Uh, it's not only about what is being what is in that moment, but what else is being signaled, and then and then creating intuitions from whatever the stimuli is giving you. So it's sort of like a dual information process in that sense. It's what is being presented and what else is being signaled. Yeah. Um, and I can imagine that would be you know, very helpful. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, we wouldn't have we wouldn't have developed in the way that we had if we couldn't, well, for a start, to be able to use those signals that come through language and communication. But, yeah, drawing drawing inferences from information that is not necessarily apparent but that is uh, implied is is a, mm. is, a is a highly uh you know it's, it's a high level cognitive skill but it's one that, mm. that serves us um very well and, and therefore can be can be adaptive and, and if you and if you bring that lens to it then you know a lot of the of the so-called cognitive biases and errors can can be reconsidered in a slightly different light Mm -hmm, absolutely. Um, and so I suppose just to, re to summarize what you were saying about uh, de-biasing techniques, because I thought it'd be very helpful. Mm -hmm. So one of the first thing is considering the opposites, which I suppose to use an example is if you're in a, if you're in a debate team, when you're preparing for debates, it's imperative that you not only prepare for your argument, but you prepare for their argument. And yeah. the rationale is, is that you need to be able to think as well as they think on their topics in order to win the best argument. So yeah. uh, that's sort of an example I'd sort of uh, attribute to your answer. And the second thing was f uh, that I took from what you were saying is focusing on the process of the thinking rather than on the outcome of the thinking. Mm. And by doing that, you're ensuring that, uh, one, if you come to a faulty conclusion, you can just change the process by which you're thinking about something mm -hmm. as opposed to so sort of trying to post ad hoc rationalize some bad argumentation to get to the answer that you want mm -hmm. so i guess and this can be done for any any sort of position or any argument for climate change you can sort of badly rationalize arguments to sort of say this is why climate change is the most important and then climate giant deniers can do exactly the same so focusing on that process of critical thinking how you're approaching the argument how you're sort of considering all the information that's what I'd say is also important. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I think that's a good way to characterize it. It's, it, it is thinking about <clears throat> how the process of thinking leads to a particular mm. outcome. And if you can sort of take ownership of that, the steps that you're going through and the information that you're using at each at each stage and reflecting on, you know, why is it that, that I'm, or is this, a, is this source of information one that I should be relying on? When I'm making this, it, why has this come to mind? I mean, it, I, I realize that it starts to paint, you, you know, it potentially paint you into a corner of I'm never going to make a decision about about anything if mm. I'm evaluating each step. But you know that we're not talking about every decision that that, that we make. I mean, I, I often uh, you know see people talking about oh we make thirty thousand decisions every day or. 80,000, mm. whatever this, you know, whatever the number is. I never really mm. see what they mean, what they actually, how they actually. Yeah, what's the implication? Yeah. Yeah. Or well, what, yeah. what, how they define a decision in that case, right? I mean, is, mm. is me picking up my water bottle, is that a decision? Does that count as one of the 100,000? Mm. <laughs> yeah. yeah. If, if so, you know, that's not something that I need yeah. to be concerned about. Should I vote mm. for a party that is um, advocating for taking strong action on climate change? That's a decision that I should be should be thinking about. Mm, mm, absolutely. Well, I mean, speaking about decisions and climate change, I thought I'd ask you: um, Are there what are the cognitive factors, or or I guess psychological cognitive factors that make people more or less likely to take action on climate change? 
if you're familiar with. Yeah, um, I mean, and, so we, yeah. we did a bit of work a few years ago looking at um, how people sort of perceive the risk of climate change and also the, the predictors of their um, mm. willingness to do something about it um, in, in terms of just sort of in, intended action rather than actual action in our, in our case. And mm. you know, our work and lots of other work that's been done in this area shows that um, one of the key drivers is, is, is what's known as uh, sort of efficacy or, or inefficacy. In other words, my perception that I can actually do something that will make a difference. Um, and unsurprisingly, if you, if you feel like your actions are going to count and that they can have some kind of impact and some agency, then you are, are more likely to say, yes, I'm, I'm going to take, take uh, action here. Other things that, that sh are shown to be strong predictors are things like um, uh, your uh, political um, persuasions, uh, your overall values, you know, whether you sort of espouse environmental values. Um, and, you know, th this is tricky because if it's really about uh, a value story, then how do you change people's values? How, mm. do, you, how do you get at, um, you know, people's ideological, political um, perspectives is, is, is are those just so kind of rusted on that it that it becomes hard but i think one way that you can address that is like i was saying um uh, before i think at one point that that you have to try and kind of align options actions that people can take to those values rather than going going against them so you have to make appeals that are going to be you know if you have someone whose main focus is on uh, improving the economic situation, then you might want to pitch things like the fact that renewables are now you know, a, a better investment than than fossil fuels. If mm. it's someone whose values are very much more in the environmental sustainability space, then you can be pitching it in terms of reducing pollution or um, mm. improving, improving green spaces around the city or whatever it might be. So, th again, it's not, it's not going to be a one-size um uh, uh fits all here but i think those those mm. kinds of um so what and what that then suggests is that the solutions that we need to offer have to be ones where people feel that they do have agency have to be ones where they feel that they can actually have some kind of influence and whether you you know you can do that by emphasizing you know the the impact of collective action over single actions you can do that by emphasizing the powers that um, governments and corporations can have if they make these these changes and you can also emphasize it through you know the single actions that we can all take but i think that the the frustration there is and the reason that people sometimes feel that low um, efficacy or low impact is because you know we can take these actions but we can see lots of people around us who aren't and and that mm. that then feels um deep demotivating and debilitating and so overcoming that that kind of issue is, is important but but i think you know when i started off looking at this work i i came from a you know cognitive psychological background and i was interested in I still am interested in you know the mechanisms underlying um how how people kind of understood the basics of things like the carbon cycle or how they understood mm. the uncertainty around projections and uh uh, and so on and all of those factors i think contribute once you can get a clearer picture of of how all these different pieces are, are put together but again it's not going to be the single um the, the, the single magic bullet that's going to change people's people's attitudes maybe to sort of dive into some sort of fun areas um let's say you were in an om omnipotent leader ben <laughs> where you had the the power to change people in a in a positive way <laughs> um and uh using your research and the lessons learned from you know uh, uh cognitive psychological factors and all that sort of research um you know what lessons and principles of judgment and decision making would you sort of download onto our collective conscious making us better for the foreseeable for the foreseeable future um, 
That's a great question. I don't. I mean, it, it's hard. It's hard to answer that without sounding. Um, what's the right without kind of sounding pejorative in in some <laughs> way, right? I mean, I, yeah. what what I would I guess what I what I would like to emphasize is, and and I guess this this comes back to some of the 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 biases or, or, or failures in our thinking that that's, that are often talked about in um, in the context of climate change and that that is this notion of, of kind of present bias or that, that we have an undue focus on the now rather than than on the future and there's lots of adaptive stories that you can make for why that that should be the case right and there's lots of work mm. that, you know, all of the work that's looked at how to um, improve people's savings for retirement focuses on this mm. idea, right, that we discount um, the future. Uh, and I think if there was one, one fa cognitive faculty that I would download onto people uh, <laughs> would, would be some way to improve i guess that that connection between the now and the future because i think that it's, it's, again it's a, it's a sort of obvious thing to say but but one of the things that makes climate change difficult to um deal with is because it's not just implications for us it's implications for people who are going to be around a long time after we've gone um, mm. and getting people to think more in that way and getting people to, um, to to try and overcome some of the kind of myopic decisions that that that, that they're making uh, would be useful but as i say it's very easy to say that kind of thing uh you know if you, if you think about it in the context of, of of saving for retirement it's very easy to say you should be saving more for your retirement because once you get there you're not going to have enough um, but we're back to this you know people's actual motivations and beliefs and, and values there might be very good reason why i'm not saving more at the moment because i just don't have the capacity to do it or mm -hmm. i have a particular you know motivation to want to live fast and die young or whatever you know whatever it might be and, it, and it's not it's not necessarily for me as the as the person to, to dictate now there's a there may be a role that it's for me because it's in the best interests of the broader society to do that and it might not be very good for you to personally if i say you can't drive your big gas guzzling car every day to work anymore that's mm. inconvenient for you but if you had the capacity or if you if you were more willing to entertain the ideas about the impact of that on the future and on future environments and you could see okay yeah right it might be easy easier for me to to drive today but the cumulative impact of that in 20 30 40 50 years time is, is such that I, I could probably take the the pain of having to get the bus today instead um it's it's that kind of trade-off that i think would be would be really uh, a good additional <laughs> faculty to have uh, uh, yes yes uh, yes yeah. as best as i can come up with yeah so the short answer is not more flower shops to make people more infatuated with the future but just a, a stronger connection to uh to thinking about posterity and um, i think that's brilliant and there's a there's a phrase that i've sort of taken which i use a lot with the podcasts and um, called The Good Ancestor by an uh, Australian philosopher where he sort of invokes this idea of, you know, uh, the good Samaritan. It's a really mm. good principle and very easily accessible to people as sort of a, uh, to sort of uh, remember to do good. Mm. Um, but why not invoke such a principle in, in a very long time horizon by saying, why don't we be good ancestors? And mm. I find that to be incredibly, um, I guess, illuminating is one way to put it. But um so, uh, uh, yes, yeah, so I think it's a call to action for us to be uh, good ancestors. I like, um, I like that phrase. That's a, good, that's a good way of summarizing it, yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But I, look, I think we're pressed for time, Professor. So thank you very much, Ben, for joining me today. If people want to find an your profile. Pleasure. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. If people want to find your profile, what you're up to, uh, and, uh, you know, want to learn a bit more about you, where can they find you? Uh, so I have a, a website that's um, hosted at UNSW, so you can you can find me there. I can send you the link if you want to put it in mm-hmm. the, yep, sure. in the podcast. Um, and uh, yeah, you can reach out to me there. Great, great. Well, thank you very much, Ben. Please stay with me uh, in the in the the green room, and uh, I'll uh, and thank you for joining me again. Pleasure. It was a really interesting conversation. Thanks.